Empire. Welcome to Inside the Cap. I'm your host, Joel Corey. You can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel, that's C O R R Y J O E L. And also, you can read my regular CBS Sports.com column, Agents Take, on Salary Cap and Contract Matters. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at two things um, roster cut down logistics and also Deshaun Watson uh, trade considerations. Um, October, uh, August 31st is an important date in the NFL. That's when rosters have to be reduced to 53 players. At 4 p.m. Eastern time, you have to have only 53 men on the roster. Right now, um, you've had a maximum of 80. So it's going to be 27 people who are released um, to get down to the 53-man limit. Also, at that time, if you have anyone who's on active physical able unable to perform list or active non-football injury illness list you got to declare where they go do they go to reserve pup reserve nfi whichever one is applicable you can terminate request waivers with those with those players try to trade them someplace or continue to count them on your 53 man list now one guy in particular that's going to be an interesting situation for PUP is Saints wide receiver Michael Thomas. He has not passed his physical, so because of the late ankle surgery, the Saints are going to have to decide, do they want to have him be out six weeks? Because if you put someone on reserve PUP, they're out for a minimum of six weeks. Then they can return. He's not eligible for IR. You go on PUP. When you don't pass your physical because of an injury from the prior year. He had the ankle problems all last year. They were conservatively treating it. Then he waited and had surgery really late. That's a classic PUP case, not an IR case. Another guy that may be interesting to watch is Patriots cornerback Stephon Gilmore, who wants a new contract, has a authorized hold in right now hasn't passed his physical because of his quad injury last year would they put him on PUP for six weeks or not Um, that's something to watch as well Tuesday is the deadline to get to 53 now September 1 you can start establishing practice squads at 4 p.m. Eastern time September 1 that's Wednesday practice squads can be established The rules from last year are in place that there are going to be 16 players on the practice squad as opposed to the 12 in the CBA. Um, There are certain eligibility categories you fall into for the practice squad. One, players don't have an accrued season. B, players are fewer than nine games on the active list. That's the 48-man active list during their only accrued season. By accrued season, we mean year of service for free agency. Max of four players for up to two years of service for free agency or accrued seasons without the nine-game active list limitation applying. And then uh, you can have six guys, um, six guys uh, regardless of their accrued season. So you could see, like last year, the Cowboys had Brandon Carr, long, uh, who they signed in, I think, 2012 to a free agent contract. Big one, like $10 million per year. He was on their practice squad at the beginning of the year. So you could see 10, 12-year vets, up to six of them, on the practice squad. Practice squad pay is a lot different under the CBA that was ratified last year. It used to be strictly uh, totally negotiable. So we had instances like when Nate Sudfeld was on Philadelphia's practice squad. He was making his league minimum salary to be on the 53-man roster on the practice squad. That won't happen anymore. For 2021, practice squad players, 9,200 per week. If you're one of these guys in the unlimited accrued season category, 14,000 per week. Also, on September 1, anybody who 
makes the 53-man roster, then gets transferred to injured reserve or after this date or the non-football illness injury list, can be designated for return. And it's going to be the same rules as 2020 that anybody can come back off of IR or, the, or NFI um, after three weeks. So this relaxed rule is, a st- is opposed to you can only designate the last time the rule worked was in 2019. Two guys could be designated for return, and they had to be out a total of eight weeks before they could return. They could return to practice after six weeks, but now – um, once a guy returns to practice after the three weeks, you got 21 days to activate him, but you can come back after three weeks is the uh, moral of the story. Now, if you are a roster bubble guy and you are unvaccinated, you probably aren't going to be playing football in 2021. All things being equal, teams are going to take vaccinated players over the unvaccinated player. So, you get cut as an unvaccinated player, odds are you're not going to be able to play because the NFL has tried to incentivize people to get vaccinated, and the treatment is much different depending upon your status. Now, just being around the team is much different. That There's no daily testing if you're vaccinated. It's every 14 days. If you're unvaccinated, it's every day. <laughs> With the Delta variant, the NFLPA wants testing now every day for vaccinated players. The league has proposed uh, seven days. We'll see where that gets worked out. If you are out on the street, last year's rule is going to apply to you if you're unvaccinated. That There's basically a five-day waiting period, quarantine period, where you have to keep testing negative to set foot in facility. So let's say week one. Somebody gets hurt in a game and they need a safety. And they're going to have workouts on Tuesday. You can't participate in that workout if you're unvaccinated because they'll make that call on Monday to set up a Tuesday workout, typical off day. You're not even eligible for that for that workout because you wouldn't be able to qualify because your five-day testing period wouldn't work. Vaccinated player can step right in. In play, that same five-day lag time th- applies to waiver claims, also traded players. <laughs> uh, so, life is just so much more difficult for you if you are an unvaccinated player. And we saw that uh, part of the difference in terms of how teams are uh, treating the unvaccinated players, not wearing masks or not wearing the tracking devices. We saw that. Isaiah McKenzie and Cole Beasley, who was the king of the anti-vaccine crowd, um, were fined $14,650 for not adhering to those rules. Now, if you keep violating the rule, it's progressive discipline, and ultimately you could be fined for conduct detrimental. And the max fine for conduct detrimental is one week's salary and or up to a four-week suspension. So, do it at your own peril. (laughs) Also, there's a big difference in what happens if you have a breakthrough infection, if you are a uh, vaccinated player. If you test positive and you are asymptomatic, you get isolated and contract tracing promptly occurs. Then you're able to return if they're two negative tests at least 24 hours apart, then you get to be there two weeks afterwards. If you're unvaccinated and you test positive, it's still the 2020 protocols. You get isolated for 10 days. Then you're permitted to return if asymptomatic. And if you have close contact with an infected individual, there's a five-day quarantine period if you are unvaccinated, whereas there is no quarantine period of a close contact with an infected person if you are vaccinated. So since they're going to get test results back on game day now this year, you could have a team where someone's available, you think, comes back a positive test, boom, they're gone. and could be gone for the next game as well if you're unvaccinated. So 
if you are unvaccinated and you're a bubble guy, you're not playing football most likely in 2021. Like it or not, that's just the reality of the situation. So um, as long as you're comfortable with those consequences, uh, if you're unvaccinated, and I know agents have explained the pros and cons when asked to their clients and have gone from there. Now, in terms of uh, cut downs, there's some things I kind of keep your eye on in terms of uh, some prominent players who could be on the bubble. Um, Rashad Perryman, not having a good preseason training camp with the Lions. They signed him to a one-year, $2.5 million contract. Deal max is out of $3 million with incentives. He started 12 games for the Jets last year at receiver. 2015 first-round pick. $2 million of his salary is guaranteed. So that would be the dead money. There's an offset. So if he signed elsewhere quickly, they could get offset up to $1.075 million if he played the entire season elsewhere. Eagles, second-round pick from 2019. J.J. Orsega-Righthead. Two NFL seasons, 14 catches, 254 yards, one touchdown. Not what you expect out of a second-round pick. He did have a 42-yard TD catch in the preseason finale. Caught, caught a pass from Joe, touchdown pass from Joe Flacco. But he's been on a bubble. So we'll see if he uh, survives cut down. Second-round pick, you don't have a, a huge cap number. It's a little over $1.35 million this year. So if they did cut him, the dead money would be the remaining signing bonus. It'd be split 2021 and 2022 since we're past June 1. So proration from future years doesn't hit the current year. It'd be $405,222 in dead money each year. Andy Isabella, Cardinals second-round pick, also a wide receiver. They drafted Rondell Moore this year. Doesn't help his cause. A.J. Green comes over as a free agent. He had COVID issues in training camp. On the bubble, preseason game with the Saints got canceled. Doesn't help him to give an opportunity for another chance to impress. But cap numbers a little under 1-3. Dead money if he's released. Uh, would be $346,794 in 2021-2022. And Jacksonville, whenever there, there's a regime change, you got the new head coach, new GM. People who were drafted high in the old regime no longer have someone who has a vested interest in keeping them around. Dave and Bryant, 2018 first-round pick, 29th pick overall. Started 17 out of 48 games in his three years on the defensive line. Fifth-year option was not picked up. Cap number, $3,239,647. Base salary of just under $1.865 million. A little under $705,000 is guaranteed. So they'll save a shade over $2.5 million if they uh, cut him. And if he got picked up, and play the whole season, then they're going to have that guarantee offset because his league minimum is 920. Uh, one to watch in New Orleans, Latavius Murray. He, it's either probably him or Devonta Freeman, who signed a veteran salary benefit contract at the league minimum of $1.075 million, which counts on the cap at $850,000. Murray has a cap number of $4,161,471. His top this year is $3.35 million. That's a $2.95 million base, $200,000 per game roster bonuses, $50,000 workout bonus already earned, and $150,000 fifth day of the league year roster bonus that he earned in March. So they would save $3,126,471 if they cut him. Dead money would be $1.05 million this year and eight fifty dollars next year. Uh, Johnny Hecker, highest paid punter in the league for the past few years. Probably won't be around. Either trade or release. The cap charges are the same either way. Corey uh, Barquez, um, who Buffalo did not tender, is an art restricted free agent. Came over to be competition. Signed a one-year deal for $1.02 million. 920 base and $100,000 bonus for one game on the active roster. So, he's had a great preseason. I... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Rams try to trade Hecker maybe to Dallas. 
his old um, special teams coach, uh, Fossil, John Fossil's there. And his old kicker, Greg Zerline, old long snapper, Jake McQuaid is there. <laughs> but his cap number is close to $5 million, $4,944,700, million, $3.75 million base. They would save three million seven hundred fifty seven thousand two hundred dollars and that odd amount comes from the CBA per diem that he earned. So dead money would be one point one eight seven point five be one million one hundred eighty seven thousand five hundred dead money this year, which is more than Barquez's salary. <laughs> and one point one four two million in twenty twenty two. So I don't expect him to be around as a Ram. Now We've seen some guys who've gotten traded at the cut down or close as the cut down is approaching. Sony Michelle's now a Ram from, from the Patriots. Gardner Minshew went to uh, Jacksonville from to the Eagles. Speaking of the Eagles, everyone thought Zach Ertz would be gone by now. Probably thought he'd be gone before the start of training camp. He's got the biggest tight end cap number at twelve million seven hundred twenty one thousand five hundred dollars. Last year. Wasted year for him. Carson Wentz was garbage. <laughs> he was the go-to guy, and then he had an ankle injury. Probably shouldn't have come back after the ankle injury. Had surgery. Um, wasn't cleared for 100% participation until close to training camp. He's looked like the old Zach Ertz that was a Pro Bowl tight end um, this year. He's had a good attitude for the most part. He's been helping young guys, working with uh, Jalen Hurts. I think he's on the roster to start the year. Um, I think if Philadelphia gets off to a terrible start and things aren't going well with Ertz because Dallas Goddard's there, so I don't know how the whole tight, tight end dynamic is going to work again. He, I don't think you can pay Dallas Goddard as long as Zach Ertz is on the roster. If they get up to a slow start and there's a team like Buffalo that's all in, was one of the rumored destinations for him anyway, he could be a midseason trade, but I think he's going to be on the team to start the year. In Dallas, Jalen Smith looks like he's going to be a backup. Micah Parsons looks like the real deal. Keanu Neal made the transition from safety to linebacker. Smith is probably going to be a backup. <laughs> um, his $7.2 million um, 2021 base salary became fully guaranteed on the fifth day of the league year. You're not cutting him. <laughs> You're not going to eat the 7-2 because he probably signed for a league minimum someplace, so you wouldn't get much of an offset. Because when you cut him, the cap number of 9-8 would be the dead money because of the guarantee. Now, if things stay the same, he won't be around in 2022. You'd have to try to find someone to trade him, probably have to eat some salary on the way out the door, in order for him not to be on the roster. He's got a $11.8 million cap number next year. $9.2 million base salary is guaranteed for injury right now and fully guaranteed the fifth day of the 2022 league year. Things stay the same. He won't be around. They'd pick up, there'd be $6.8 million of dead money. Now, one last guy. To me, the New York Jets situation screams we need a veteran presence at quarterback behind Zach Wilson. Um, Mike White looks like he's got the inside track to be the backup. He's never played in an NFL regular season game, passing one. You know, and if you keep three right now, it'd be Josh Johnson, who's a journeyman, who's, I don't know how many exact teams he's played with, but it seems like he's been signed to practically every roster in the league. Not what you really want in terms of a veteran to help Zach Wilson. One guy screams out that would be perfect for the Jets. That would be Nick Foles, who has a history with Joe Douglas, the Jets GM, from their Philly days. Only problem is the way Foles' contract works. Um, Chicago's probably not going to be that interested in eating any more salary for what is their third-string quarterback. He's expendable there because Justin Fields is second string for now. Andy Dalton's the starter. But he's making $8 million this year. $4 million fully guaranteed base salary. $4 million fully guaranteed third day of the league year roster bonus. They've already eaten four. They don't want to eat any more. Now, the problem is Foles' 2022 salary. The $4 million base salary is fully guaranteed. 
and the $4 million third day of the league year roster bonus is fully guaranteed. So you'd be taking on $12 million of guaranteed salary if you're the Jets. So you'd probably have to work with Foles, maybe what you would do, what you've seen with other guys in the past who get traded or, or take pay cuts. You lop off a year of the contract, so you lop off the uh, 2022 year, so it'd be a free agent, and he comes in for just the four. If you're uncomfortable having him for eight as a backup next year, um, mentor. And maybe there's some value for him being a mentor. I don't know what the price tag would be on that. But that's another guy I would um, keep an eye on as we get to the regular season and you see roster shuffle. Now, here's one thing you're going to see in the uh, cut-down process. There are going to be guys who make the 53-man roster. And because guys are subject to waivers, just because you, if you're a back-end guy and you make a roster, doesn't mean you're there come week one. You can still get cut because it happens every year. The guys make the 50-man roster. Somebody gets picked up on waivers, two, three guys. Somebody's got to go, and then somebody else gets cut. So look for that as well. But Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, is the deadline for the roster cut down. 253 players. The Deshaun Watson trade rumors are starting to heat up again. Um, yesterday, there were reports that Houston could be trading him in the next few days, and they're asking price three first round picks and two second round picks. The team that's in the hottest pursuit, reportedly the Miami Dolphins, Carolina Panthers. Also, show, showing some interest, Philadelphia Eagles, Denver Broncos, rumored to have interest as well. Watson has a no-trade clause, so he'd have to waive it in order to be traded. Since he doesn't want to be in Houston, <laughs> I, I would wonder if any uh, any place is better than Houston, so he'd waive it for anybody. But uh, suppose his preferred destination is Miami Dolphins. One of the reasons is Will Fuller signed there um, in the offseason, who was one of his go-to receivers in Houston, Carolina, supposedly second in the pecking order. I know the Eagles have shown plenty of interest. A couple of problems with this whole trade thing. <laughs> One, I'm not sure how you can get full value for Deshaun Watson right now, given the unresolved issues regarding the sexual misconduct, sexual assault allegations. There's been a school of thought that he would be placed on the commissioner exemplist, which would kind of take him out of playing football, a paid leave of absence. They haven't done that yet. Um, investigations for the NFL run slow um, for any type of uh, personal conduct policy violation. And I'll give an example of one. Um, 2019, during the regular season, Antonio Brown's um, conduct came to light. That investigation dragged on through all the 2019 season. And although he was out of football because uh, he got released from New England, they didn't discipline him until 2020. He was suspended on the personal conduct policy for the first eight games of the 2020 season, even though things came to light in 2019. These are all 2021 allegations in terms of when they've come to light. They actually occurred in 2020, but nobody knew of them until 2021. So the investigation could go on that type of time frame where you could have things bleeding over into 2022. Plus, if you traded for Deshaun Watson, would the league then put him on a paid leave? So you'd have to work out some sort of conditions in terms of the compensation for it to make sense. Conditional picks where some of these first round picks would get reduced to second round picks depending upon the timing of the suspension and how or games out or if there's a paid leave of absence or maybe the second round picks become third round picks but I don't see anybody meeting that asking price while this is a cloud hanging over his head until you know definitively what any punishment is going to be that's just me maybe there's a way to be creative and work out the trade that satisfies both sides but from a compensation standpoint, the team which is in the best position would be the Eagles. 
I don't know how much that Garner Minshew trade factors into their thinking of whether they could get Deshaun Watson or not, but you traded for a quarterback yesterday, very cheap one, who would be, I guess right now, your third string and maybe become the second string once he learns the offense instead of Flacco to replace uh, Jalen Hurts should he falter. But the Eagles have their own 22nd first-round pick, Miami's 22nd first-round pick, potentially Indianapolis's 22 first-round pick. Right now it's a second because of the Carson Wentz trade, but it can become a first depending upon his playing time. Um, I think it's the same percent as the threshold for it to become a first-round pick. Um, they have their own second-round pick as well, and they have their own picks in 2023. So from a compensation standpoint, they're in the best position. Now, Miami, they're in a pretty good position as well. They don't have their own 22 second round pick. Philadelphia has it, as I just said, but they have San Francisco's, which is going to be a late first round pick if things go well for San Francisco. They have their own 23rd first round pick, and they have San Francisco's uh, 2023 first round pick as well. So those teams from a draft capital standpoint are in the best position. But then if I'm Miami, if I'm getting Deshaun Watson, and maybe it's a little bit risky, if Houston's interested in Tua, which took the fifth overall pick in 2020, and in 2021, I mean in 2020, could he go back? And then you have to go with Jacoby Brissett as your quarterback if something happens to Watson. <laughs> but and either way, the fact that Miami, it's out there that they supposedly have a lot of interest <laughs> In Deshaun Watson, that's not a vote of confidence that two is your guy long term. So if they don't trade for him, I don't know how, how that's going to affect him. Um, they did something unusual last year in having Ron Fitzpatrick become the relief quarterback because typically once you bench a veteran, you go with the young guy for better or worse. Let him take his lumps, but Miami didn't do that last year, so... Maybe they're just not sold. Obviously, they're not sold on to, or they wouldn't be having these supposed conversations. Now, from a contractual standpoint with Deshaun Watson, it was just about a year ago. He signed that four-year extension for $456 million. He had two years left on his rookie contract. He's got a cap number this year of $15.94 million. $10.54 million is a base salary. So if you acquire Deshaun Watson this year, you are getting him for five years under contract for $146.54 million, which is a bargain for who he is. That's under $30 million per year is what you'd be picking up. Now, after this year, the salary in 2022 is $35 million. In 2023, it is $37 million. That's a $20 million base salary and a $17 million Fifth day of the league year roster bonus, then $32 million salaries in 2024 and 2025. You only need $10.54 million of cap space to acquire him, which is his base salary this year. Houston from the trade would have $5.4 million in dead money. That's the proration of the $27 million signing bonus um, that he has in the contract for this year. Then next year, you would have uh, $16.2 million of dead money. From the remaining pro years of proration, that'd be three years of proration, running 2022, 23, and 2024. Now, I'm just skeptical that something gets done um, with Deshaun Watson just because figuring out the trade compensation to me is just kind of hard to do right now. Then, if he's still on the roster in Houston, there's no trade. Are they willing just to eat a roster spot for him? <laughs> Go with 52 players, or I should say 54 or 50. You can go up to 55 if you elevate two practice squad guys. And just shorthanded one guy because they're willing to pay him not to play. Easiest thing would be for the league just to put him on a paid leave of absence for um, Houston standpoint. Um, I think David Culley, the head coach, made a comment about him being healthy. So it would be kind of hard to kind of put him on ice and IR. <laughs> Right now, unless he just all of a sudden had a mysterious injury, assuming he's still a Texan, um, in practice next week. But they seem very comfortable not having him play. <laughs> um, I don't, would he even want to play? Because they don't want to be in Houston anyway. <laughs> but no, we'll see if something gets done um, on this Deshaun Watson trade standpoint. But it became news yesterday that 
something could be uh, imminent next couple of days. There was a report back in early August that something was imminent with Philadelphia, which obviously didn't come to fruition, so that was wrong. So we'll see if that's the same case here. Um, but anyway, that is this week's uh, Inside the Cap. Uh, don't forget, you can find me on Twitter. That is Corey Joel, C O R R Y J O L. And also, I have my CBSSports.com column and agent's take. Thanks for listening. Goodbye, and we'll see you back here next time.